I'm honored to have the opportunity to be here. As others have already expressed, I do believe with all my heart that the overall topic of leadership is a very vital subject and one that needs to be studied, and I believe that it's altogether appropriate that we are studying this topic at this church. As long as I have been a Christian, which is a comparatively short time uh, with regard to comparing it to others that are in this auditorium this morning, the name Bellevue Church of Christ has been synonymous with faithfulness. And we appreciate that very much, and we appreciate the elders of this church and their willingness to have this study. I want to commend you and thank you for your courage and confidence and being willing to uh, bring in a bunch of preachers to talk for nearly a week about the uh, qualifications and the duties and responsibilities of elders and deacons and and preachers probably too to some extent. But uh, it might be hard to get preachers to plan a lectureship to spend a week talking about what our duties and responsibilities (laughs) and qualifications are. So that takes a lot of courage and... uh, and a lot of confidence, and we do appreciate that very much. We appreciate all that has been done to make us comfortable here this week. Uh, We appreciate the delicious food and all the work that the ladies and others who work behind the scenes have done to make us comfortable. And uh, that's been very kind of you, and that is much appreciated. I uh, appreciate Brother Michael Hatcher, and I appreciated him uh, far more until he said, at the very outset of his remarks, that he knew this lectureship was about to get tiresome. And uh, that uh, that really gives you a lot of confidence uh, when you're about to speak and, and people uh, are about to be tired. But I hope that won't be the case. Now, I appreciate Michael very much, and as he mentioned, I knew his uh, father and mother, Bill and Peggy Hatcher, Uh, before I knew Michael, and uh, I appreciate them very much. And it was uh, Michael's father, uh, Bill Hatcher, who was primarily responsible for encouraging me to become a gospel preacher. And I shall never forget that, and I appreciate that very much. And as I have listened to Michael preach and uh, heard him speak uh, this week in, in various situations, and even as I read the inscription in the lectureship book, I stand amazed at the power of heredity and genetics. It it is an amazing thing. I I could tell you uh, other details, but Michael even writes like his father. And I just don't believe that was learned. He didn't ever sit beside you and say, now Michael, here's the way you, you write in longhand. I don't believe he did that. But it's, it's an amazing thing, and I wanted to say to Michael, whenever you preach a good sermon and whenever you have written another uh, fine manuscript, just remember, it's, it's genes. It's heredity. You just have good genes. It, it's not because of anything much that you have done, but uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. He's got good genes. I can vouch for that. And he's, he's doing a good work with them. Uh, let me just say one final word of appreciation. I appreciate the fact that I've been able to associate with these great soldiers of the cross who are speaking on this uh, uh, lectureship this week. And I appreciate so much the kindness and the graciousness that they have extended to me. I consider myself somewhat of an amateur in this setting. And I believe I mentioned to Brother McLeish last evening that... Uh, I know uh, in the NBA and the NFL and professional baseball, they don't treat rookies too well. But I want to say I appreciate the way these veteran preachers uh, treat us rookies. And uh, I appreciate that very much, and I wanted to say thank you for that. The specific subject that I have been assigned is David, great leader of men. And David is truly one of the most fascinating people about whom we read in God's book. David was a multi-talented man, if ever there was one. At various times in his life, he served very capably as both a shepherd, a musician, a soldier, 
an inspired poet and a king. In addition to that, he was a fascinating man because he was a very complex person. Depending upon the situation, he could either be tender and forgiving, or he could be fierce and he could be deadly. And so David was truly a fascinating man. He was truly a great leader of men. And he is someone from whom we can learn much if we determine to follow his example. And this morning I would like for us just quickly to think about some of the major traits and major behaviors that made David such a great leader of men and that made him such a great example for each one of us. The first thing I would like for us to notice is that David prepared himself for leadership. Early in his reign, you will remember that Saul, the first king of Israel, failed an important test of faith at Gilgal by not waiting for Samuel, the prophet, to come and to offer sacrifices and to provide instruction relative to the Israelites' upcoming campaign against the Philistines. And we see God's disapproval of Saul's uh, disobedience in 1 Samuel, the 13th chapter, and verses 13 and 14. If you will notice those verses with me, uh, 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. We know that that man after God's own heart of whom he spoke was the youthful shepherd David. And we also know from reading the Bible that while Saul was committing various sins that caused God to reject him and to remove him from being king, David was preparing himself for leadership. And uh, we know that David's son Solomon was inspired to write, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. And David is a wonderful example of the wisdom of obeying that commandment. While uh, David could not have known specifically what opportunities God was going to set before him in the future to serve the Lord, uh, David had prepared himself in various ways for service. For example, we know that David had evidently spent numerous hours uh, as he was a shepherd tending the flock in his spare time, if you will, he must have spent numerous hours slinging stones with a sling because he had developed marvelous accuracy with a simple but lethal weapon. And uh, just a personal note, growing up in North Georgia as a, as a young boy, my brother and I, whose name happens to be David, my brother David and I made flips. We made both flips, young people, and you probably know that flips are the are the uh, weapons that you shoot this way. But we also made slings. And if you're just listening to the tape, you don't know the gesture I've just, just made. But uh, we also made slings. And slings are quite different from flips. Uh, and we, we would use those slings that you pass over your head in this fashion. And you can sling a, a big rock very hard with a sling, and that's sounding redundant, so I'll say you can throw a a big rock very hard with a sling. And uh, we we didn't develop great accuracy with our slings, but we got to where maybe we could uh, hit a telephone pole maybe three times out of ten, throw a rock and hit a telephone pole. And I, as a child, have knocked some pretty good-sized chunks off a telephone pole with rocks thrown from a sling. So I can promise you these may be simple weapons, but they are potentially... Uh, lethal weapons. In addition to that, uh, practicing with his sling, David also evidently spent many hours playing the harp and developing his uh, uh, tremendous talent for music. Also, and far more importantly, David had evidently spent countless hours in prayer to God and in meditation upon God's Word. 
because he was a young man who had kept himself pure in heart and in life. And this fact is indicated by God's response to Samuel's surmise that perhaps Eliab, David's older brother, would be the one selected by God to succeed Saul as king. And notice we see that in verses 6 and 7 of 1 Samuel, uh, the 16th chapter, And it came to pass when they were come that he, uh, meaning Samuel, looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Well, these words of God indicate to us that uh, David was a man who had prepared himself as a young man to serve the Lord by keeping himself pure in heart and in life. And when this uh, verse emphasizes the fact that God was looking at the inner man of David, uh, this doesn't mean that David was physically ugly because in various places in the Scripture he is described, for example, as goodly to look to, a comely person, and of a fair countenance. But these verses do indicate that it was the condition of his inner man which made David so attractive in the sight of Almighty God. And I think of uh, an illustration that I heard, a story that I heard of a, a young black boy <clears throat> who was uh, attending the fair in his hometown. And in attending the fair, he noticed that a man was selling balloons and the balloon salesman, from time to time, in order to attract attention, would release one of the balloons. And he would release a red balloon and a blue balloon and a white balloon and an orange balloon. And the little black boy came up to the balloon salesman and he asked him a question. He said, Mister, if you release one of those black balloons, will it, will it go as high as those others? And the balloon salesman said, Son, sure it will. And he released one of the black balloons and then went way up in the sky just as high as the others. And the balloon salesman said to the boy, he said, Son, you remember, it's the stuff inside that makes it rise. And what is true of balloons filled with helium is far more true and more importantly true with regard to people. It's the stuff inside that makes people rise. And David had prepared himself uh, for leadership. Young people especially, young and old alike, we need to prepare ourselves for leadership. But young people, I stress to you, guard your heart as the Bible teaches with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart and keep your mind pure. Be careful what you put into your hearts and into your minds in terms of what you read and, and what you watch on television and what you watch on movies and so forth. Uh, prepare yourself for leadership by keeping yourself pure. Uh, there are those sitting in this auditorium uh, who I am totally persuaded did that and who now God is using in magnificent ways to serve Him in the kingdom and to do His will. And I will embarrass him by mentioning it, but I shall do it anyway uh, because it's true mainly, but it doesn't really break my heart that it might embarrass him. But uh, I believe Brother Joseph Metter is an example of that. I was privileged to go to the Memphis School preaching uh, together with Brother Joseph, and I believe he is an example of a young man who prepared himself for leadership, and now God is using him in wonderful ways. And God bless you, brother, for doing that. The second thing I want to mention is that David possessed great faith in God. He could lead people, and God could use him because he possessed great faith in God. And he demonstrated this faith in God on numerous occasions. And perhaps the most memorable occasion when he demonstrated his great faith in God was in his magnificent defeat of the Philistine giant Goliath 
recorded in 1 Samuel the 17th chapter. And do you remember that we learned here that while Israel and the Philistine, the Israelite army and the Philistine army were camped in the foothills of Judah, of Judah in a stalemate situation, that uh, a nine feet and nine inches tall giant came out uh, day after day, as, as a matter of fact, twice a day for some 40 days, and challenged the Israelites to send their champion out to fight him. And he proposed that the army whose champion won the duel would be declared the victorious army, and that would make full-fledged combat involving thousands of soldiers and mortal combat unnecessary. And the Bible records the reaction of the Israelites to this swaggering giant and his recurring challenges. Notice in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 17, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were intimidated by this giant. And yet, at this critical time, God provided His people with a champion whose most powerful weapon was His unwavering faith in Almighty God. And you remember that Jesse the Bethlehemite sent David, his son David, to bring provisions to his three older brothers who were serving in Saul's army. And you remember that while David was performing this mission, he heard the defiant challenge of Goliath. And yet this young shepherd was not afraid like the other Israelites. And we see his courage in verses 26 and 32 of 1 Samuel 17. Notice verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And then notice also verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And so David was not intimidated by the giant. And as he determined to meet the challenge of Goliath, David's faith in God was so strong that he refused to be discouraged by anyone in what he had determined to do. For example, he refused to be discouraged by his older brother Eliab. And we see that in verses 28 and 29 of 1 Samuel the 17th chapter. Notice, And Eliab his older brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? That's about as encouraging as this lectureship's about to get more tiresome. I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou might see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? David would not be discouraged by even his own brother. And furthermore, David would not be discouraged by King Saul. Notice what we see in verses 33 and 36 and 37 of 1 Samuel 17. Verse 33, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But then notice verses 36 and 37, David declared, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And I'll tell you something else. David wasn't going to be discouraged by Eliab. He wasn't going to be discouraged by King Saul. And he certainly wasn't going to be discouraged by his swaggering opponent, Goliath. And Goliath tried also to discourage David. But he wasn't going to be discouraged. Look at verses 40 and following of 1 Samuel 17. 
Beginning in verse 40, we read that David took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. My friends, David's confidence was not in David. David's confidence was in Jehovah God. And with faith like that, we can know and we thrill to read how the Lord crowned David's effort with success. Notice verses 49 and following, And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and, and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharon, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. My friends, David was a great leader of men because he possessed great faith in Almighty God. And every Christian, especially those who lead us as God's people today, needs to possess the confidence in Almighty God that was possessed by this young shepherd boy, David. We, the church as a whole, must have confidence in God in order to face the giants that threaten the spiritual security of God's people today. We have to have confidence not simply in ourselves and, and certainly more importantly than that, we have to have confidence in God to face the giants of atheism and liberalism and humanism and modernism and worldliness and all of the other giants that we face that threaten the spiritual welfare of God's people today. Individual Christians need confidence in God, real trust and confidence in God conjoined with obedience in order to face the giants that they have to overcome in their own personal lives, their own personal opponents. It might be physical illness. It might be mental illness. It might be emotional pain and suffering of some kind. It might just be loneliness that people face. But if we have the faith and the confidence in Almighty God that David had, we can meet these challenges and be victorious. I don't have any doubt in my mind whatsoever that David had great confidence in his ability to sling stones accurately. It's interesting that he, he did collect five, though. I mean, he figured, well, you know, I might miss a time or two, and then I'm going to settle down and, and I'm going to nail him in the forest. But the most important basis of his confidence was not in the fact that he had thrown so many stones with his sling for so many hours when he was out there with the sheep. 
but the real basis of his confidence was that he was convinced that he was serving an omnipotent God and that that omnipotent God would crown his efforts with success. And let me just say by quick word of application, I'm becoming apprehensive because I think Michael's about to come up here. I don't want him to do that yet. Let me just say that those who lead us today especially need to have confidence in God and in order to lead us in doing His will as they should, they need to recognize, perhaps more than any of us, that our success in any endeavor, whatever it may be, as long as it's consistent with the will of God, our success in any endeavor does not depend solely on our own hum human capabilities and talents and, and abilities, whatever they may be. To some extent it depends upon that, but more importantly, it depends upon our trust and confidence in Almighty God. What was the pipeline of God's power that defeated this giant? The pipeline of God's power was the faith, the confidence, and the trust that David had in God. And I wish I had time to develop that, but our faith, our trust, and our confidence is the pipeline of God's power, whether you're talking about saving power, the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ, the, the providential uh, care and keeping of Almighty God, or whatever it is. The pipeline of God's power is man's faith, man's trust and confidence in God. But then thirdly, let me mention quickly that David was a great leader of men, uh, not only because he had prepared himself for leadership and and possess great faith in God, but because he pursued a godly way of life. In Ephesians 5 and 1, the Apostle Paul was inspired to exhort us, Be ye followers of God as dear children. And the word translated followers could be accurately translated imitators. We are to be imitators of God. And a major reason why David was such a great leader is, for the most part, for the most part, he so loved and admired God that he sought to imitate God. Someone has well said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I can, I can tell you in just a little while, if a person truly loves and admires another human being, that becomes apparent many times because the one who admires someone else will imitate that one whom they admire. They may speak like them. They may pronounce words like them. They may use gestures like them. And as I understand it, for a great many years, there were numerous gospel preachers going around uh, imitating Brother Hardiman in various ways. Why? Because they so loved and they so admired Brother Hardiman. Well, if we love and admire God and the Lord Jesus Christ, should it be hard work to imitate the Lord and to seek to behave as they behave? It should not be. Well, David loved God and he, he admired the Lord and he wanted to be like the Lord. And there are various ways in which he was like God. He had, for example, a forgiving heart. And the fact that he had a forgiving heart is seen numerous times in connection with his relationship with Saul. You remember that King Saul, as a result of David's stunning victory over Goliath and uh, his meteoric rise to popularity among the Israelite people, you remember that as a result of that, Saul became insanely jealous of David. And over time, this jealousy actually became hatred. And Saul determined to murder David. And on three occasions, he personally tried to murder David, once by inciting him to daring combat with the Philistines, and twice with a javelin from his own hand. And then furthermore, Saul sought to use his army to murder David. They, they were ordered to pursue David, and they did. They hunted David like an animal. And as David fled from Saul's army, you remember that on two occasions, at the cave of Engedi and at the hill of Hakilah, David had the opportunity to kill Saul. But David did not kill Saul. Because of his respect for God and because he had a forgiving heart and forgiving attitude towards Saul, he refused to take those opportunities. He said, I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed, 1 Samuel 26 and verse 9. Why? Because David had a forgiving heart. 
We see that further in the fact that after the deaths of Saul and his three sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua at Mount Gilboa, we see that in that beautiful song of the bow that we read in 2 Samuel, the first chapter, that David grieved over Saul just as much as he did his dearest friend, Jonathan. And he praised the man who had sought his life. David had a forgiving heart. After David had consolidated his power over all of Israel, do you remember what he did? He said, I want to find a surviving member of Saul's family to whom I may show the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake. You remember that in 2 Samuel 9? That's one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible. That's a beautiful picture prophecy of how the God of heaven is so ready, willing, and eager to show the kindness of God to us for Jesus' sake. I wish I had time to dwell on that more, but you remember he restored to Mephibosheth, the crippled son of Jonathan, all of Saul's property. Furthermore, he said, Mephibosheth, you're going to eat at my table as one of my own sons. That is that is the man David. He, he had... He pursued a godly way of life because he had a forgiving heart. Let me quickly mention two other ways in which he pursued a godly way of life and we need to do so ourselves. Even as an absolute monarch, David retained a penitent heart. You remember that subsequent to his horrific sins of adultery and murder in connection with uh, committing adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband Uriah to try to cover his sin when he was confronted with that sin by the courageous prophet Nathan. David's response was, I have sinned before the Lord. He confessed his sin. He was forgiven of his sins. And he, because of the grace and mercy of God, escaped the eternal consequences of his sins. He had to suffer some terrible earthly consequences, but he escaped the eternal consequences of those sins. And then finally, let me just say that another indication of David pursuing a godly way of life was that he was sacrificially devoted to building the house of God. David wanted to build a a more permanent place of worship to God. He wanted to build a temple to replace the tabernacle as, as a place of worship. And yet he was prevented from doing that, you remember, because he had shed so much blood. And while he was prevented from building the temple, God commended him for desiring to build the temple and God used him to make most of the preparations for the temple. And you remember that those preparations for the temple included a personal contribution from his own personal treasury of some $613 million in gold and silver about which we read uh, in First Chronicles 29, And we read about David encouraging others to generously support the construction of that house as well. Well, we know that God's temple today is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a a, a spiritual house. We are God's holy temple, Ephesians 2.21, 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. And every Christian, and especially our leaders, in order to pursue a godly way of life, we need to imitate David and, and be those who are sacrificially devoted to building up the house of God, First Thessalonians 5 and verse 11. Oh, thank God for all the great examples of leadership that he has afforded to us in the pages of his holy book. Thank God for David. He's a great example of leadership and may God help us to imitate him as he imitated God that we might be more profitable servants ourselves.